Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to welcome you back for our next installment of the CNS Controversy Podcast. Uh, today, we have a, an esteemed guest uh, with us, Dr. Jason Schwab, who uh, is joining us today to uh, talk about neuromodulation versus uh, revision spine surgery for uh, radicular pain and low back pain. Uh, Dr. Schwab is a uh, clinical professor at Wayne State University, uh, as well as the surgical director of the Movement Disorder and Comprehensive Epilepsy Center at Henry Ford uh, Health System, uh, and works across multiple uh, campuses. He has also served on multiple committees in national neurosurgical organizations and is heavily involved in health and advocacy. It's a pleasure to welcome you here today. I have with me uh, my co-host, Dr. Seth Oliveira, and myself, Rashna Ali. Thanks so much. So, you know, Dr. Schwab, this uh, conversation and discussion has been going on for almost over two decades now since the initial uh, trial came out. So for the audience listening in, would you be able to give us some of the main pearls uh, that came out of initial evidence supporting neuromodulation versus revision spine surgery for recurrent low back and leg pain? Sure. I, so, I mean, I think the, the kind of pivotal paper that anyone in this field should be aware of was one by uh, Rick North that was published in the Red Journal in 2005. And um, Rick was at Hopkins. Uh, and worked with his spine surgery colleagues and um, basically set up a randomized controlled trial where they would look at patients um, and they had to be patients who had undergone prior spine surgery that the spine surgeon felt was a candidate for some sort of repeat procedure, be it decompression or fusion or you know something in the lumbar spine. Um, and um, you know, they weren't patients who were grossly unstable or had progressive neurologic deficits or a clauda equina or something like that. Um, but they were kind of the typical patients that we often see in our clinic uh, that have had spine surgery and have either developed new problems or didn't get a lot of benefit from the initial spine surgery and then randomize those patients. And it was a small trial, it was about 25 patients per group. Um, and the patients who underwent spinal cord stimulation like did much better. And the thing that's so impressive about this trial, I mean, this was done, what, 18 years ago uh, that it was initially published was, was that they actually got three-year follow-up. So it's not just that like, spinal cord stem wins at three months, you know, because patients are recovering from their fusion. You know, when you look at three year follow-up, um, spinal cord stimulation is superior in, in just about every way, including cost. You know, and I think that's something we worry about and, and payers worry about is the cost of the implant. Um, but, but the reality is, is that three years, you know, these patients did much better. So, you know, I think the question is, why aren't we doing a lot more spinal cord stimulation and a lot less spine surgery? And I think this really speaks to kind of shifting sands. So, you know, spine surgeons say, well, you know, we're doing things pretty differently than they were in Hopkins in 2003, 2004. Um, the payment models are a little bit different. So maybe the economic analysis that Dr. North published in 2007 isn't quite as valid. Um, but on the other side, you know, the reality is, is that spinal cord stimulation is much, much better than it was back then. Um, back then, they were using uh, the Resume uh, electrode from Medtronic, which was like this little button electrode that was about eight millimeters in diameter, and there were four of them on a, on a piece of silastic. And now we've got all these complex electrodes with different waveforms with or without paresthesias. So... Um, you know, we talked, there were many of us actually that, that had submitted a proposal, uh, including myself and Andre Machado and uh, Josh Rosenau. I think Julie Politsis was part of that as well, you know, trying to redo this trial with, with more modern techniques about five, 10 years ago. 
um, and unfortunately you didn't get any takers. So, you know, I, I am happy to uh, consider redoing this trial uh, against any spine surgeon who's willing and, and really, you know, trying to see what the long-term outcomes are with more modern techniques. That, that's a that's a perfect segue into into the next question, uh, which was going to be if you were to design this trial in in the current day and age with um, all the technological advances that have occurred, um, what are some of the pertinent differences uh, in the study design and perhaps the analyses that you would incorporate? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I sort of said that facetiously because it would be very difficult to figure out, you know, how to do the trial. I mean, currently with spinal cord stimulation, you've got four companies in the U.S., you know, actually five companies in the U.S., you know, additional com companies coming into this space you know, with different pr proprietary stimulation paradigms. Um, and, and it's kind of hard to know, you know, frankly, I find it hard you know, when we're talking to patients, if they, they're coming to me and they haven't already had a trial, you know, which one do you choose? So, so that's an issue, you know, and similarly on the spine surgery trial side, um, the, there's always, you know, the question of what's the right operation to do. Um, there's the old adage that if you put you know, four spine surgeons in a room, you'll get five opinions. Um, and, and I think that that's, you know, kind of relevant to this as well. So it, it's super hard to to really be able to do a prospective randomized controlled trial. I mean, I think that's true in general in, in both these fields. Um, one thing that could be done uh, would be a large prospective registry and that would include radiologic data. Um, but, you know, you know, I think even though, like I, I help run a very large uh, statewide um, registry for spine surgery, it, 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 even that is is probably not adequate, and we collect huge amounts of data uh, with a large number of fields. But you know, we we still haven't figured out how to collect the radiologic data and collect uh, data about what makes pain better or worse and quality of pain. You know, it it just becomes incredibly onerous um, to to get the huge amount of data that you really need probably to to be able to do match cohorts. Fair enough. So um, you touched upon this um, a little bit before, but what are some situations where using neuromodulation instead of uh, revision spine surgery would not be appropriate and vice versa? I think, you know, if you look at the original trial, um, there were patients who didn't have, and I think in general, it's really not appropriate to do neuromodulation in a patient with a progressive neurologic deficit, period. So, you know, but the reality is that most of the patients that are getting spine surgery in the US don't have progressive neurologic deficits. So, so you know, I think it's I think it's a significant option for a lot of patients. And, and then obviously, you know, a patient who has an infection after spine surgery is not someone you want to be implanting, you know, leads into, into uh, an active infection. Um, I think for patients who have really gross instability um, that you think might lead to a progressive neurologic deficit, it's probably not a good idea either. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I was just going to ask you, what's the sort of the, the kind of uh, opposite question? You know, where, where's that patient where you think there's sort of equipoise where it could kind of go either way? I think it's the patient that has that has pain. Well, actually, let's 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 go the other way. I mean, I think there are obviously patients that you know repeat or revision spine surgery is like totally inappropriate. You know, so, a patient with a battered root syndrome, you know, where three months after surgery they develop burning dysesthetic pain. There's no compression on the MRI of the dorsal ganglion or something like that. Um, a patient with arachnoiditis, you know, that those are not patients you want to be taking to the OR and doing repeat spine surgery. And, and then everything in between there, <laughs> you know, the patient with pain without a, neuro, a progressive neurologic deficit, um, you know, who doesn't have like, you know, severe, severe lumbar stenosis uh, and isn't grossly unstable, you can, you can really consider both. 
I mean, I think um, obviously it's hard with spine surgery to do a trial, right? That's the nice thing about neuromodulation is you can always say, well, you know, let's do a trial. If the trial doesn't work, you know, then you can go the route towards a, a traditional decompression or fusion or something like that. You know, if, it, if the patient has characteristics that make them seem like they would do well with that. Um, uh, but, you know, I mean, I think, I think we tend to do what we're used to doing and we have our own biases. Um, so, you know, if you ask many of us who do neuromodulation, we're like, oh, that, you know, that repeats spine surgery doesn't work, you know, because that's what we see. Um, and, and similarly, you know, the, I talked to my spine surgery colleagues and they're like, oh, yeah, I took out another spinal cord stimulator. It didn't work. You know, it, that, that stuff never works. You know, we need to put in, a, you know, uh, and, and fix the patient's titanium deficiency um, by fusing them T10 to pelvis. So, um, the reality is, is, is frankly, you know, somewhere in between. I mean, I mean, I'm sort of reminded when I was a, a fellow, you know, we see patients who had failed microvascular decompression for facial pain and, um, you know, had come from Dr. Janetta. Um, that's how long ago I trained and, and my mentor at the time was like, yeah, that MVD stuff, that doesn't work. Well, no, it does work. It's just, you know, the few in whom it doesn't work. You know, were the ones that were showing up in, in his clinic. Um, and, and I think, you know, similarly, the reality is, is that, you know, most patients do very well with spine surgery and most patients do very well with neuromodulation. Um, and they're both, I think, feasible options for a lot of patients. Um, a lot of times you have to weigh it, you know, based on um, the patient's health and, and what you can predict is happening. And, and I think that's kind of a problem with this as well. I mean, you're kind of making a guess, okay, well, you know, in three years, neuromodulation wins out, but, you know, what happens in five years or 10 years? Um, and the reality is we don't really have great data for either, right? Like you think that you're going to fix that patient, you know, once and for all by putting in a bunch of titanium, you know, pedicle screws and things like that. But, you know, a lot of those patients have problems as well, you know, as you move forward, or at least, you know, a not insignificant proportion, a fraction of them do. Yeah, I think that's really a good point about the longitudinal part of it that we don't always think about. And you know, I think that is kind of one of those situations that there is some equipoise, that I guess, in my own practice, where I worry that if there's a patient I'm worried that they may, they may develop more problems in the future at other levels nearby. Um, that's a person you might be more interested in spine surgery, where yeah, like, like you said, you know, if you have an elderly patient who probably needs a big spine surgery, but that's maybe not a good idea for them, you might consider a stimulator just to, you know, kind of for quality of life. So I, I think all those kind of gray areas come into play in, in real life for sure. Yeah, and I, and I think that that's, you know, I mean, I think that's what's pushed us a lot, right? You know, we have patients that um, they're older, they have very classic you know, MRIs or, or other imaging studies that show that they would benefit from traditional spine surgery, um, they're worse when they're uh, up and walking around, they're better when they lean over a shopping cart or when they're lying down and unload their spine, you know, but for other medical reasons, they're too complex, they're too high an operative risk. And we end up putting a spinal cord stimulation, the simulator in that patient, and they do great, right? Mm -hmm. And so that kind of makes you think, well, maybe we could do it for the patients who aren't quite so sick and aren't, you know, and, and are candidates for, for traditional spine surgery, mm -hmm. um, rather than do, you know, a big, potentially morbid operation uh, where, you know, you're doing pedicle subtraction osteotomies to restore their sagittal balance, you know, may, maybe that patient will do great, you know, for five or 10 years or, or longer with, with a stimulator. So other than um, age and uh, frailty, are there any other patient specific factors that sway your decision one way or the other when there's clinical equipoise? Any uh, psychological factors, comorbidities, like depression, I mean, I that, BMI? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think the, the patients who have, you know, significant depression or significant opioid use, uh, high BMI, they're, they're going to do worse with either option, right? Like they're kind of a problem for either. And, and so you want to try and 
treat those things, you know, try and increase your, your chances with either traditional spine surgery or neuromodulation to get a good result. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's hard. There's nothing, um, obviously it's less invasive. So, so for patients who have comorbidities uh, that you're concerned about their ability to undergo a, a large spine surgery, um, or if they, you know, have a, uh, they have they have a condition where to get an adequate decompression, you're going to destabilize them and have to do an extensive fusion. Um, you, you may want to consider doing a, a stimulator or at least trying it, right? Like the morbidity from doing a trial is really low. Um, and, and so you can always do a trial, see how that patient does, um, even implant them, see how they do. And if they fail it, you know, then you've got other options in your pocket. Um, but I think in general, you know, as a, as a surgeon, you want to expand your toolbox, kind of be aware of all your options and, and work with the patient to figure out what the best choice is for them. Um, and they may come to you with their own biases. But, you know, the, the reality is, is that a lot of times these decisions are not made by you, right? Um, so sometimes it gets made by you, but, but you've got patients out in the community who are seeing uh, anesthesiologists or physiatrists who are trained in pain medicine, um, and they may implant patients um, without ever getting an opinion from a spine surgeon. Um, we're seeing some of the uh, pre-approval companies, you know, like Turning Point here in Michigan, uh, where they're requiring an attestation uh, from uh, spine surgeons saying that the patient is not a candidate for spine surgery before they would approve uh, a trial of, of spinal cord stimulation. That is ridiculous and not supported by the evidence. Um, there is no evidence that spine surgery is, is superior uh, to spinal cord stimulation. And frankly, you know, a lot of the evidence points the other way. That's a really difficult situation, which thankfully is very uncommon where someone's already had a trial and you think they're not a candidate. Can you think of examples of that where how often are you turning someone away who's had a successful, what was, you know, kind of deemed sent to you as a successful trial? You know, sometimes, I mean, I think you have to, you have to question the trial. Um, the trials are, frankly, they're becoming more difficult to interpret. Right. So because you always have this issue of the fact that the trial is limited by concern about infection. So in general, in the U.S., it's like seven to 10 days, sometimes even less. And now we're using all these stimulation paradigms where the patient doesn't feel the stimulation. They're super invested in um, getting a stimulator. I, I mean, I've had patients, you know, I've explanted a year or two later that have come from other places where you know, they've admitted that they lied, you know, that they had greater than 50% improvement with their trial because they were told that's what we have to tell the insurer to get a permanent implant. So, um, and, and then there's the issue, you know, a patient with uh, paresthesia-free stimulation paradigm of regression to the mean, right? Um, their, their pain varies naturally. They're not being uh, as aggressive with their movements, maybe not doing the same things that normally bring out their pain during the trial because they don't want the lead to move. Um, and so frankly, it, it can become a little more difficult to interpret the trial. I mean, there is actually like this movement and, and some papers that have come out recently saying that like trials are a waste of time and you should just implant these patients. Um, that, that may be hard to justify in, in the financial uh, space in the US, but but you know, there, there is some evidence for that. And, you know, the fact that I have to trial um, one of the systems for either spinal cord stimulation or peripheral nerve stimulation that actually doesn't have an internal pulse generator. So, you know, basically the insurers are saying, we want you to double the cost by basically doing a trial and then doing a permanent implant with the same exact equipment, you know, doesn't make a lot of sense financially either. Um, so, I mean, I think in general, it, it's kind of hard to figure out um, exactly, you know, which patients are, are going to do great with their trial. And that's, and that's why we do have an explant rate um, at, at, you know, a couple of years that's probably in the 20 to 30 percent range. But the reality is, even so, you know, the economics seem to work out. 
um, that it looks like you, you know patients are costing the health system less um, it, 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 when you aggregate all the data and, and look at how many patients do well and, and are utilizing less resources. So do you have any kind of estimate of what the negative trial rate is? It's pretty low and it's pretty low with um, with with a lot of the newer uh, devices, especially the ones that are paresthesia free. And that and that's where you get these, you know, there's the paper published recently um, in, in the red journal um, that, that basically said, you know, trials are a waste of time. Um, Cause you, you know, I, I mean, it depends. I mean, if you get your positive trial rate up to, you know, 80%, 85%, like it, it's just not cost effective to do trials. So I know our um, discussion has focused on um, neuromodulation for uh, low back pain and radicular pain after uh, failed spine surgery, but uh, what are your thoughts on um, uh, SCS or any type of neuromodulation for virgin backs with similar symptoms? I mean, I think it's an option, you know, as, as we said, you know, for older patients who are too frail to undergo spine surgery, we've been doing that. So that kind of points the way that it's an option for, for patients, you know, aside from spine surgery. If you look at the SEMSA trial, which is now published, you know, what, five, six years ago, the two-year outcome, you know, about 15% of those patients had not had prior spine surgery. So, um, it, you know, there, there are patients, you know, with back and leg pain um that are not you know as long as they're not unstable don't have a progressive neurologic deficit it's definitely an option um and, and so you know i think it's it's going to be interesting to see how things change and practice patterns change you know, based on uh how these patients you know navigate through the health system um because a lot of them might not ever make it to a spine surgeon Well, this has been a riveting discussion as we come uh, to the end of our time today. Are there any uh, pearls you would like to leave our uh, uh, listeners with? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think the the one thing that I try and teach our residents and our fellows um, is, is the importance of really coming up with a diagnosis. And we've worked really hard, I think, the past 10 years to try and get rid of this uh, diagnosis of failed back surgery syndrome. It, it, it's pretty meaningless. And, and so, you know, I think the most important thing when you're, when you're seeing a patient who's had prior spine surgery is really trying to figure out, especially from the history, because sometimes it's hard to tell from the physical exam, um, you know, what, what is going on? You know, was there a failure to correct the initial pathology? You know, is what you're seeing, is this a complication of surgery? or progression of disease, you know, or was the patient like not a good candidate for surgery in the, in the first place? Um, and that happens too. You, you know, I think we see patients who, you know, got spine surgery and, you know, it was just the wrong diagnosis. Um, or you're trying to treat, you know, these patients who have back pain like all the time and they're sleeping in recliners and there's a lot of catastrophizing. Like that patient was never going to do well with traditional spine surgery. Um, and, and I think, you know, trying to figure out exactly what's going on with the patients, you know, will help direct you to what the next appropriate therapy is. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, for our listeners, please uh, visit uh, cns.org and follow us on social media for uh, this and more upcoming uh, podcasts.